Now let's deal with Pergamus, or Pergamon it's also known as. The word Pergamus means objectionable marriage. It's a two-part word that means two things that have come together in, uh, to become one that should not have. Objectionable marriage. In the Old Testament, we see this uh, represented in several different places. Uh, God told uh, the children of Israel not to intermarry because of idolatry and them being led away to, for, uh, to uh, foreign gods. Um, we'll see that the do it's going to mention the doctrine of Balaam, and we'll deal with that in a second and how that's the same thing. But Pergamum is where Satan started to get a foothold in the church, a foothold that was never let go of, and that is the major uh, reason for a major part of the battle that we're going to find in Revelation 17 and 18. It starts here. Now remember, each of the seven churches represent a time period of the church age. Uh, Ephesus was from 30 AD, right after Jesus, right during Jesus, to 100 AD. That's Paul's time. That's while John was still alive. He was writing to the church of Ephesus. And to, to, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the first letter, one of the first letters John wrote to the church of Ephesus was uh, First John. And in 1 John, he warns them of the spirit of Antichrist and says this spirit is already here. Now, the word Antichrist, we use it in our modern day to represent the evil man of sin that's going to be the world dictator, the final world dictator, according to the Bible, and he'll be possessed by Satan himself. However, in the Bible, they typically use a different term for the Antichrist. There's many different terms. There's over 30 different terms just in the Old Testament. One is the Assyrian, just to give you an idea. But the word Antichrist in general, when John does use it, John's the one that wrote the book of Revelation, he typically is talking about it more as an overlying spirit of Antichrist rather than the one man. Now, there, it does culminate in one man, and they do use that title for him as well, so the title is fine, but it's a popularized title that the Bible actually doesn't really use that much. But when it does use it, like in 1 John, he says, watch out for the spirit of Antichrist that he says is already here on the earth. In other words, and then he, te he tells you what that spirit is. He says, this is the spirit that denies that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. So essentially, anything that says, hey, Jesus might be here, he may have lived, but he wasn't virgin born, or he did not die, or he was not God. Um, those are all objectionable things. Those are things that were attempting to uh, rise up during the church of Ephesus, but they followed instruction and they kept it away. So God said, good job on that. Uh, they probably tried it during the church of Smyrna, but that was during persecution. There's not much you're going to get through there other than hold on, and God blessed those people. But here we get to the church of Pergamum, and this is an objectionable marriage. Here is where we're going to see that spirit interline itself with the church and that stays with the church. As a matter of fact, it is significantly in a part of our culture today and that's why it's important that we understand this and it's going to culminate in Revelation 17 when we talk about Mystery Babylon. That's going to have a lot to do with what started here in this church of Pergamum. That's why I wanted to make sure we get an understanding of this, because this is the roots for where the Antichrist will come from, what, the, what uh, it is that we're looking at, and why. What's wrong with the church today? You want to know what's wrong with the church today? It started right here. Let's read it. Uh, Pergamum. It's uh, uh, Revelation 2, beginning at verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamus write, These things uh, saith he that has the sharp sword of two edges. So first he gives himself a title. And the title he gives is also a title that you see throughout the Bible. You see it in Revelation. You see it in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, I believe it is. It says, uh, The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. The word two-edged there is diastomus in the Greek. Di meaning two. Stomus meaning mouths. Two mouth swords. So Jesus has authority on this earth because he came on the earth as a man. And God gave authority to man. God has power, but he gave authority to man. But Jesus came as a man, and now he has the authority to speak things into existence and to raise up and destroy as he sees fit. Uh, the two mouths that we're supposed to speak, we're supposed to speak like him. We speak what he speaks, and that's how we execute things on the earth. Just a little bit of Bible information for us so we understand how we operate in this dispensation. Um, but here, it says the way that Jesus is going to deal with this is by he's going to speak with his mouth and he's going to divide. What did the Bible say? A two-edged sword is sharp enough to divide even between the spirit and the soul. This is how Jesus will divide the truth from the false, the goats from the sheep, the wheat from the tares. 
uh, verse 13, it says, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, catch this, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Let's deal with this. First of all, Antipas. He was a, 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 a martyr during that time. He was a high-ranking member of the church. And when I say high-ranking, they do uh, not like the Nicolaitans where he was high and mighty and hard to get to. Where rather, he was a, a, like an apostle. Uh, it doesn't call him an apostle, but along those lines, in terms of he was sent out from God and he helped build up or plant churches. Uh, it was probably what we would call in today's time a bishop. And he was one with the spirit of God in him. And even the people that came, according to the stories, to capture him, to take him to his death, were convinced that this man is truly uh, of God. That one, they didn't even want to bring him to, uh, to uh, I believe it was Nero that killed him. And so God is comparing this and saying, hey, the people who will not, uh, who will not uh, mingle with the world, things of this world, uh, Satan is going to go after them. But that's okay because you won't see the second death and persecution is part of this walk with Christ. It goes on and then says, but this is where Satan's seat is. Now, Jesus said this, but he said it twice. I don't believe in allegorizing something that the Bible does not make it clear that it's an allegory. If Jesus doesn't make show it clear that he's speaking metaphorically, because obviously he can speak metaphorically as well, then I take it literal. Why? Because when you look through the history of the Bible, those who took things literal are the ones that typically end up getting it right. No matter how crazy it sounds, how unlikely it seems, it ends up turning out that way because the Bible was outside of time and God knows in advance what it is that he wants to accomplish. So I don't allegorize things that are not allegory. I don't know if this is allegory or not, but he said it twice. Satan's seat is here. So that leads me to believe that Satan's seat is probably there, either in Pergamos or where Antipas died. Those are two different cities. One was one is uh, Pergamos, which is uh, in Turkey right now, uh, like all the rest of the seven churches. The other one, which is not too far away, is in Geneva, Switzerland. That's where Antipas actually died. So there's a lot of people on both sides of the fence that believe that this is actually where Satan resides. What do you mean? Satan's not everywhere? No, he's not. You know, the Bible uh, makes it clear that Satan was an archangel, like Gabriel and Michael. Archangels are not omnipresent. God is omnipresent. Satan is not God's equal. He's not the opposite side and equal to God. He's simply uh, a fallen angel. He's an unemployed cherub is what he is, and he is not omnipresent. He has a very good hierarchy, a very good system of devils that work with him, demons that work with him, and he sends and dispatches them to deal with uh, each person that he's dealing with. So it may seem like he's everywhere, but no, he's in one place. And according to Jesus, Jesus, that one place is Pergamus. Um, in Pergamus, they have the, the typical uh, shrines and altars and temples to gods, but they also had a really large temple. It was larger than our football fields are today, where people would worship and they had orgies and all kinds of crazy stuff over there. And a huge statue to Zeus during this time, which they called their chief god. And so this may be referring to that when Jesus said, this is where Satan's seat is himself. Now, I just want you to realize how much this stuff is intertwined in our American culture to where we think it's just cute. We just talk about, oh, Zeus, Hercules, you know, Achilles heel, uh, Venus, and women are from Venus, and men are from Mars, and uh, Cupid's arrow, and all that stuff. These are names of demons, that Jesus said when they saw the statue, he said that's where Satan's seat is himself. And we play with it because it's become so intertwined in our society because of what happened here in Pergamum when they were married together. There was no longer a separation of church and state, but they put the two together and God said this is where his seat is. The other idea on this, though, is that uh, because we know Antipas actually died in Geneva, Switzerland. Well, if that's the case, and that's where Satan's seat is, that may make sense as well. Right now, um, over in Geneva, there's a thing called CERN. I don't know if you've heard about it or not. I won't get into too many conspiracy theories. I'm not really a big conspiracy theorist. At the same time, I recognize that what the Bible says is true, and a lot of things that people will call conspiracies are simply just 
true. They're coming to pass. Well, there's this thing called CERN, and it's a particle collider. It's over a mile long. It's miles long underground. And they're attempting, the scientists uh, say they're attempting to recreate the atmosphere of the Big Bang. What they believe how as gases got together and collided together and created all this somehow miraculously out of nothing, all these people came, yeah, and evolution and all that foolishness. Well, scientists are attempting to recreate that. And obviously these are pagan scientists that don't care much or believe much in the spirit world. However, they do say that there's something on the other side that they believe they can access, something in another dimension that they believe they can pull through. These are words that are just coming directly from these scientists. Well, the word CERN, if you look at their logo, it appears to have uh, multiple sixes. Uh, in a circle, uh, around a circle. Um, a lot of people will say that that's three sixes. I don't know, maybe. Um, they had a huge shrine, however, of an actual devil outside of CERN's complex. They literally, you see them signing documents and, and, right, and uh, signing uh, new contracts and things like that right under this shrine that is clearly a demon. I don't remember the name of the shrine. It's not a Baphomet, but it's something along those lines. You, you look at it, you know it's a devil. And they didn't care. They used that as their symbol. And so whatever is going on there, and we don't know what they're colliding together, what that's going to cause at the end times. But there's a lot of speculation about the fact that that's also in Geneva, Switzerland, that they have the shrine, that they have the 666, and according to the Bible, that might be where Satan's seat actually is. Just some food for thought for you. I don't know what you're going to do with that, but I find it interesting. Uh, Jesus goes on and says, But I have a few things against thee, because you held the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Guys, this is important and this is where this entire book for, for me starts to take off. I want you to understand what he's saying here. Balaam, for those of us that don't know, uh, is in Numbers 22. And he was like a witch doctor. The Bible actually refers to him as a prophet, self-proclaimed prophet maybe. But he was, uh, had some sort of access into the spirit world. And it's really an unusual story because God raised up prophets in Israel only for Jews. In the Old Testament, it was Jews versus everybody else. Jews were the people of God, and everybody else was pretty much outcasts. And Balaam was not a Jew. He came from the outside, and his purpose was to receive money to curse the children of Israel because this man, Balak, realized that the children of Israel had power, and they, and they, and they had a God that was with them, and he was was not able to defeat them. So he said, let me call this witch doctor that can cause a curse to come on them. But God himself actually met Balaam and said, you will only speak what I tell you to speak. First, he told him, you can't even go. And we have the whole instance where the donkey talks and everything. Really cool story. Just read it in Numbers 22. But uh, after this, what happens is Balaam goes but he only says what God says to say. He only speaks blessings. He's, he speaks about the star that's going to rise from the east. This is where we get the idea of the star that was over Jesus. It came from this man, Balaam, this witch doctor, who seemed to be obedient. However, a few chapters later, it just shows Balaam being killed with the sword. It doesn't say why, but it seems to be a justification for something. And then we get into the New Testament, it shows that they speak about Balaam very backhandedly, very uh, in a bad way. So it made me wonder, like, what happened? Because the Bible just showed that he spoke blessings, and then the next thing you know, he was being killed. I didn't see what happened in between. Well, you have to read and through the Bible, and it begins to tell you what happened. A lot of times, God doesn't concentrate on the sin because he's not trying trying to uh, magnify that. Matter of fact, there's instances here in the seven letters where you see somebody is blotted out because of sin. Their name is blotted out. There's things that will be blotted out from the Bible that we have to learn about to figure out what happened. And it tells you here that Balaam taught them to cast a stumbling block to, in front of the, the children of Israel. And it tells you what that stumbling block is, to eat things sacrificed to idols um, and to commit fornications. And we learn from the word of God what actually happened. Balaam said, look, I cannot speak against them because the spirit of God will not allow me to curse whom God has blessed. Again, Hebrew Israelites and all the people who anybody that's against uh, the Jews that are over there in Israel, this is why this is important. I need you to understand. You may think, oh, we were just, you know, doing what we were taught, or this is what was in the news, or uh, we're Americans, or we're the Jews, or whatever it is you want to believe. It doesn't matter. You don't speak against that who God has blessed. 
And so Balaam taught them. This is what he said. He said, I can't speak against them. God won't allow it. But what I'll do is I'll show you how to cause them to become cursed themselves so that the hedge of protection will be lifted from them and God himself will smite, his, smite those people. So he taught Balak what to do. God told them not to intermingle. And he specifically said, don't mess with the Moabites because the Moabites will mess you up and they will cause you to go after other gods. Well, the Moabite people under Balak did what Balaam said. They sent gorgeous single women to camp all around the camp. And you know what happened. The men came out. They fornicated with them. They took them as wives. They caused uh, idolatry to come into the camp. And God smited his people. So the people were truly punished because of their own error. And of course, God went back, though, and got that prophet that even though he didn't speak against them, he still taught how to get them to be messed up. Well, he caused there to be an intermingling of the bad with the good, even through marriage. And Solomon, after um, King David, Solomon married all these foreign wives, the wisest man to ever live, and then messed up how? By marrying other foreign wives who pulled his heart away from God to idolatry. Here during this time, in Pergamum, this is time of AD 300 to 600-ish, that time period. You know what's going on during then? This is when Rome, who is uh, the, the major power of that time period, is moving their headquarters uh, further over to what's called Constantinople, now in Turkey. In this, time, in this area, this is what's happening. And when it moves to Turkey, Constantine then realizes that Christianity is spreading. Because of persecution, Christianity spreads like wildfire. Christianity, the spirit of God, spreads through persecution. You don't get rid of them. It causes it to become overwhelming. People see the presence of God. They feel the presence of God. They see the difference in the people who are being killed, and they desire what is real. So it causes it to spread. So it spread so much where Christians were now taking over where pagans were. So they have all these pagan priests that said, what can we do? There's too many Christians out here now. Uh, they, you know, the, the Christians are the ones with the most money, the most taxes, the most everything. It is now no longer politically uh, advantageous for us to persecute the Christians. So what can we do? Constantine says, we're going to not separate church and state anymore. We're going to bring them together. We're going to let Christians be the church religion. Sounds great, right? It's a state religion now. Uh, no less persecution. The problem is they mixed the paganism with the Christianity to appease both sides. They took the same priests that were the priests of the Babylonian cultures in Babylon. They called uh, these people, uh, what they call them? Uh, we went through this. Uh, Semiramis and Tammuz. And then you get over to the Egyptian culture and it's Horus and Isis. You get over to the Greeks and it's Cupid and Venus. And so they took those same people who were uh, worshiping those same gods, those priests, and they just said, you're now Christian priests. And we're going to make the church, state church the Catholic church. Catholic means universal. The word Catholic means universal. And we will find that's what God is battling in these last days. You're also going to find a, a rise of the Muslim religion will eventually come from this commingling. Keep in mind, this is really important. We will get to details of this as we deal uh, further into Revelation. But this all morphs into... Uh, 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 an inappropriate marriage between the church and paganism. And they even took on paganism's culture. See, let me show you how deep this goes. Uh, I mean, everything from the days of our weeks that we call the days of our week, those are named after pagan gods, Greek gods. Whenever you're doing with these horoscopes and things that the Bible says stay away from, you're giving homage to a Greek pagan deity. Whenever somebody says, oh, well, I just pray to the universe, that's all universalism that came from mingling. Of the church with state, it is all things that God is fighting against. Look at uh, Easter. Let me give you a good example there. 
Easter is name is actually the word Ishtar, which was one of the goddesses that was uh, worshipped by the, uh, the Greeks. Ishtar uh, um, uh, and Asheroth and Asheroth poles and all those sort of things that we see in the Old Testament, they all come from the same people. So Ishtar's celebration was an orgy that happened in these big temples that happened around the same time period as Passover for the Jews. So around the same time they're celebrating Ishtar the Jews uh, or, uh, were killing Jesus around that same time period, Passover. So when they mingled them together, they said, well, these two holidays are close enough together, so we're just going to say Jesus died on Ishtar. We're already celebrating Ishtar. Let me show you how the way they celebrated Ishtar. They had orgies in the temple because it was a fertility god. They used uh, bunnies because bunnies represent sex, and that was the symbol. They had eggs to represent the fertility, and they painted the eggs with the blood of aborted children as a sacrifice to this God. Do you see how much of that has gone into, now we just call it bunny rabbits, Easter, we say we're celebrating Jesus, we're doing the same paganistic rituals that were brought in by the Catholic Church and said these are one. It was an objectionable marriage. Christmas is the same thing, absolutely the same thing. Christmas Day is around the winter solstice, which is when the sun shines the least amount of time and they were worshiping town moves during that time, or Cupid, you may call it at this point, uh, in the Greek society, uh, of a rebirth, a rebirth of Cupid, a rebirth of Talmud, a rebirthing uh, with the new sun that's coming. And so December 25th, they still wanted to celebrate that holiday. So what they do? We just say, we'll say that's Jesus' birthday because we're marrying the two together. And so this is going to cause the, this is what is the issue, the biggest issue in terms of us reaching God even today. There's so many traditions that we have. You know, the, the, the logo on a star Starbucks cup is a straight up demon. It's a siren. <laughs> it's easy. You hear, read about them in history, in the Bible, wherever you want. It's a demon. It's an actual demon as a logo. We sitting there drinking that. That's our expensive special coffee. It's everywhere. It was married into our society and God hates that. It is the same thing as Balaam. Okay, I can't speak against these Christians. I can't stop them. So I will cause them to cause stumbling blocks for themselves. And it will be so interwoven into the fabric of their society that they won't even know the difference. This is why God puts the greater punishment on the people who, sh who bring this in than on the people themselves. Because most of the time the people, especially after a generation or two, are clueless. They don't know. They genuinely have genuine hearts just trying to serve Jesus. They don't understand that this was brought in doctrine. So God says, be not many masters because you will receive the greater condemnation. That means if you're the one that you're selling everybody, you're in charge. You're telling everybody you're hearing from me and yet you're causing issues or you're bringing the wrong thing. You will have a worse penalty than the people because you said you knew what was going on and they followed you into destruction. Do not be a Balaam. Do not be one of those who are cursing what God has blessed. Do not be one of those who are bringing on more objectionable things. And that's what happened during this time of Pergamum. And you'll see, even through the rest of the time period of these churches, that there was still consistently a spirit of Antichrist that stayed and more and more falling into sin all the way up into the time period we now we are in now. It came from this objectionable marriage in Pergamum where the church brought in paganism and married them together. It was the Roman Catholic Church that brought this on and we will see very specifically when God calls them out in Revelation 17 and other places and how he's going to deal with that because of what was done. There's actually a nuclear explosion and God blows the entire city of Rome up. And I'm just giving you some of the end before we get there. This is Revelation 17. This is also going to tell us a lot about America. I don't have time to get into this today, but where America is in the Bible, it's going to uh, surprise some people and some other people it will not. And essentially, we are the people right now that are causing the rest of the world to ab adopt a further uh, uh, paganistic Balaam, essentially. We are pushing our own agendas, the anti-God agendas, and we're trying to force them on the rest of the world. The Bible shows us, let's deal with America real quick, because a lot of people have questions, where is America in the Bible? 
Let me show you. The Bible shows us here in the book of Revelation that there's things that are blotted out based on not lining up with what God said. So certain sins are in by omission. You find them by omission. In the Old Testament, there are 12 tribes of Israel. And we know in the book of Revelation, there's also 12 tribes of Israel that will be sealed and go and be protected by God. But you'll notice there's a difference in the Old Testament, there's a tribe that's missing in the New Testament. And the tribe that's missing in the book of Revelation is the tribe of Dan. Dan, according to um, early in Genesis, when uh, when uh, blessings were being given out, Dan uh, was spoken, they spoke a prophecy over each child. But the prophecy of Dan was not good. It said, you will be like a snake that nips at the heels of those passing and causes them to stumble. In other words, you're going to be the reason that causes a stumbling block to enter Israel. Fast forward to the book of Revelation, Dan is missing. There's still 12 tribes, as God promised 12 tribes, but he takes another one, Joseph, splits it into two and uses them to replace Dan. Well, in the Old Testament, Dan had a symbol. You know what their symbol was? The eagle. And the eagle is simply missing in the New Testament when it comes time for blessings because they caused a stumbling block for their fellow brothers. You want to know why America is missing from the, uh, the New Testament in Revelation? I'm telling you right now. We as the church will be removed from this place. We will be lifted up and saved and spared. The Bible says, Jesus says, pray uh, that you be counted worthy to escape these things that are coming on the earth. And once that happens, there'll be no one left here in America, but those who believe that wrong is right, right is wrong, and are forcing evil ideologies like homosexuality and all the other craziness on the rest of the world. God says, you're like the tribe of Dan. You're not even worth me explaining what's going to happen to you. You just won't be there anymore because you're going into destruction. The Bible says the Antichrist has such a large army who can make war with him. America has more bases across the entire world, military bases, than just about the entire world, rest of the world combined, just America, he's going to be in charge of that. How? I don't know. I just know there's destruction and there will be a loss. And there's a reason why America is not listed, especially not as one of the good guys in the end times. Like the tribe of Dan, that will be blotted out for causing a stumbling block and attempting to bring on a further objectionable marriage. I hope you guys are excited. We still have four more churches to dive into. We will get into that in the next video. Definitely out of time here. But uh, next video, we have Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, which brings us all the way to our current time period, which is right before the end of this dispensation, where we're about to go into the next phase, which is the final seven years of trouble that is going to hit this earth. Let's get these last four uh, churches. Uh, and if you have any questions, you guys, I believe you have, many of you probably have my app at this point. But if you don't have it, download it now. Kingdom Keys. It's in the App Store. It's in Google Play. Download Kingdom Keys. You can send your own questions uh, to me about what's going on and more questions about America, or Revelation, whatever it is. And I'll make a video and answer any of these, those questions. I hope this has been a blessing to you guys. I'm excited to keep on going. We'll continue in the next part part two where we get to the next four churches. God bless you.